My early career as a self-taught software developer can be defined by three distinct traits. Number one, absorbing and practicing everything I could, whenever I could, however I could, in order to understand my craft. Number two, feeling consistent urges to gouge my eyes out and go back to working at the United States Postal Service whenever a missing semicolon would break my program for six hours or more. And number three, suddenly receiving six to ten daily coupon deals from local chain pizzerias once I started learning PHP and didn't have the physical or mental fortitude to make dinner for myself. The first six to twelve months of learning software development on your own are brutal. Not only are you stuffing your brain to the point where it feels like it's about to literally explode, you're also perhaps competing with naggingly negative thoughts about your competency. Nothing quite destroys confidence quicker than failing a so-called simple coding challenge or having a hard time reading JavaScript examples from the Mozilla docs. Going from level zero to level one in this industry takes time, it takes patience, and a lot of failing. A lot of failing. This is the phase where people not only quit, but they stay quit. They just get so downtrodden because they can't figure this stuff out. And if you feel like you're at that level zero and you're ready to take a step forward, today I'm going to help you by showing you a four-step process to assist you in solving any single coding problem. Whether you're doing coding challenges on places like Code Wars, figuring out a feature for one of your personal or portfolio projects. You could even use this technique at technical job interviews to really illustrate to your employer that you're a process-oriented thinker. So let's go ahead and get to it with step one. You want to articulate this in human language. Don't worry about the code just yet. Many times, like on a coding challenge site, the problem is already stated. Sometimes the wording is a little rough. So go ahead and rewrite the problem so that it makes the most sense for you. Read it over a few times, make sure nothing is lost in translation. And if you take a closer look at these problems, they're structured just like high school algebra word problems. And that's kind of comforting because we know there's definitely a solution at page like 682 of the teacher's manual. There's a solution out there. It just looks really abstract right now. Let me give you an example of defining or articulating a problem in human language. A kid's fruit counting game needs functionality. I need this program to add the number of fruits the user provided at any one time and display that number. If the number is not provided, give a message that tells him no fruit have been added yet. So right away, I can put my high school algebra education to use. Thank you, Mr. Frisbee, because I see a special word, is. Now in math word problems and algebraic word problems, is translates to the equal sign. So even though I might not have any great insight yet on how to exactly solve this thing, I can already see these little these little flashes of light, these little light bulbs. There's already an instantaneous translation into something that's one small but illuminating step closer to our solution. I'm getting in that positive feedback loop. It's not a lot, but I'm getting there. So I'm going to reformat this problem. It's not quite pseudocode just yet, but it is phrasing it in a way that I can understand. And I'm re-articulating this problem. First of all, I'm going to separate these different statements on different lines. So number one on the first line, a kid's fruit counting game needs functionality. I'm not seeing anything that's popping up here that I can change, so I'll just go, just keep separating this so my mind can see it as three distinct issues. I need this problem to add the number of fruits the user provided at any one time and display that number. If the number equals not provided, give a message that tells him no fruit have been added yet. So again, I know this seems small, but it can be a real confidence booster getting in that feedback loop, that positive feedback loop, reminding you that the translation to a computer readable solution is already in play, but it's still in English. And once you've done this, it naturally oozes into step two, which is iterate and translate. Like any other programming task, you'll find yourself going over and over and over the same problem, reading it, absorbing it, assessing it, repeating, iterating. Each time you do this, your brain hurts just a little more, and that is the feeling of thinking, my fellow developers. So you're on the right track. This cycle is called an iteration. So now it's time to start translating this problem while you're iterating. Don't let all that brain energy go to waste just by looping through this problem in your head and not getting anywhere like a hamster on the wheel. Take action for each iteration. Let your human language problem start morphing into a programming language solution. And now that we're really morphing this language, it's called pseudocode. 
It resembles a programming language, but it's designed for you to use more human readable terms to solve your programming problem. It's not pure code, but we're getting there. For example, let's go back to our fruit counting program we defined in step one, and then we're gonna add some pseudocode here. So a kid's fruit counting game needs functionality. I need this program to add up the number of fruits the user provided at any one time. No computer program that I know of is going to be able to read and parse this so that it solves my problem but this is one step closer to translating it into a pure programming language. I took this clue right here, functionality. I said, mm-hmm, functionality, that means probably function. I'm gonna go with that. And then I need this function to compute and display the results to the user. So I added that pseudocode right here. Next line of the problem, if the number is not provided, give a message that tells them no fruit have been added yet. Now, if is another good word that you can use to your advantage in solving these problems. And so I was able to extract this requirement and turn it into pseudocode right here. If the number is undefined, print no fruits have been added, give me some fruits. Now what's nice about pseudocode is that there's no standard, there's no compiler. In this case, not having a standard works well for you because there's no one to tell you, hey, you forgot to indent on line 62. Pseudocode can't break and it's totally up to you how you form it. The purpose of it is to give your brain a step one in translating your problems into code. Now that we have our pseudocode out there, we're gonna solve this entirely in a programming language of our choice. We've worked hard in the last two steps to get us to the moment we've been waiting for, solving this problem purely in a programming language. We're gonna go over our pseudocode and hopefully by this point, your brain has been making some connections to how this should look as a real program. I'm gonna use JavaScript here and I'm not gonna go over the theory behind this code. What I'm doing is taking what I know from that language and applying it to complete the problem so that I have minimum functionality. All I want this thing to do is work and I'll worry about making it perfect and making it pretty and all that stuff in the next step. For example, I haven't thought out the different use cases for this program, so I'm just gonna use JavaScript's argument object so that I can have an indefinite number of arguments. We're gonna make this as broad as possible. We just wanna prove that it works. So you might also be facing an issue here too because if you're new to programming or if you haven't had a lot of experience with a specific programming language yet, it's possible that this step is gonna stop you dead in your tracks. You stack overflowed it, no dice, it might stop you slowly in your tracks. Either way, computers are very strict inventions. And unfortunately, you can't invent JavaScript theory or syntax on the fly yet. Notice, not yet. So what happens if you get to this step and you're stuck? And what happens if you don't know where to go after reading the language's documentation or testing some similar code you saw on Stack Overflow or whatever? At this point, your eyes might be glazed over. You might feel like quitting. The negative thoughts are starting to drip in. This problem is dull. Maybe I'll go learn network security. Programming sucks. These thoughts are natural, but you don't have to listen to them because we're gonna take a detour. I'm gonna call this step 3.5 reach out, ask for help. This is a collaborative industry. Despite the stereotype of unsocialized nerds living in a dank basement, cranking out brilliant code on zero sleep and Mountain Dew code red, the overwhelming majority of good code is the result of a concentrated and collaborative effort. Not renegade coders, not I'm doing it my way. All that said, you're stuck, you're tired, you tried, reach out, ask your mentor. Ask your Discord groups. I've seen a lot of people just post problems on Twitter and they get responses from people who care about the industry. So when you're working with your helper, be sure to actively listen to this person's feedback and take notes. A lot of this stuff is second nature for them, but not for you. So they might be talking a little quickly or whatever. Jot down what they're saying so you can reference it later. We've consulted our help group. We're gonna come back. Here's my solution for the fruits problem written in JavaScript. Finally, step four improving your working solution. After countless hours thinking and hacking, multiple emails to your code helper, a 12 pack of pomplamoose down the hatch, you finally got your program working. So now it's time for an extra round of fortitude testing because number one, developers love to hurt themselves in weird ways. And number two, there's only one thing better than solving a coding challenge, solving that coding challenge optimally. Oftentimes your first solution isn't the most efficient. And honestly, what gets most of us paid in this industry is efficiency. Efficiency of communication, efficiency of actions, of programs. The technical term for redesigning our program to run better or more efficiently without changing its functionality is called refactoring. 
So a good way to kick off this process is to just ask yourself, how else can I solve this? What are some alternative ways? Don't be afraid to experiment and break things. Just set aside your original solution in a safe place and play around with a copy of that solution and see what you come up with. My first refactoring effort here is going to be changing my function name and my variable name to something more semantic so that myself and other developers who might work on this know what this stuff is. Naming these things more descriptively is a sort of self-documentation that really makes the development and maintenance process more efficient. These are the four steps to solving any coding challenge as a newbie. This method may seem like a lot of work, and it is, but the alternative will take much longer. Stick to the systematic, stick to this process. You will find yourself saving so much time and frustration than just picking and pecking away at Stack Overflow solutions for hours on end. I've been there, trust me, this is part of the reason why I made this video, because I know so many other people are in that situation right now where they can't find a solution and there isn't a lot of positive feedback being fed to this person. So whether you're doing coding challenges like those on Code Wars or Pramp or figuring out a feature for one of your projects, you could even use this technique at a technical job interview to really illustrate to your employer what a process-oriented thinker you are. So let me recap what we went over for this four-step process in solving any coding challenge. Number one, write down the problem. Write it in English, segment it, separate it. Give your brain some room to breathe with the problem. Number two, iterate and translate. Go over the problem again and again. Start pseudocoding and getting one step closer to the pure programming solution because that's going to segue you into number three, solving the problem in a programming language. If you're having trouble with this step, don't be afraid to reach out. And finally, number four, improve the working solution, AKA refactor. As programmers, it's our job to solve problems. This four step technique can bring us to the solution in a clear, logical and efficient process that not only helps us do our jobs, but also improves our problem solving abilities and confidence levels. Whether you're trying to build a simple fruit counter or tweak the last function that will land our pet dogs on Mars. I don't know why we would do that, but I'm sure someone's working on it as we speak. Maybe it's you. Code on and prosper. I hope you guys are having a great day. If you enjoyed this video, if you learned something, please hit a thumbs up, leave a comment, be sure to subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.